The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. From the University of Maryland, this is Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff. In our modern industrialized and globalized world, trade and competition between nations is growing tremendously. While the United States' share of global manufacturing is shrinking, new economic powerhouses are on the rise. What do these shifts mean for the U.S.? What are the roles of China, India, Korea, Brazil, and other rapidly growing economies? Joining us to discuss international trade and changes in the global economy is Ambassador Susan Schwab, former United States Trade Representative under President George W. Bush, and now the host of Policy Watch, Doug Besherov. Susan Schwab, welcome to Policy Watch and the University of Maryland School of Public Policy. Thank you. Pleased to be here. Actually, it feels a little strange saying welcome to the University of Maryland School of Public Policy since you were our dean for so many years, uh, but welcome back. Thank you. Uh, so for almost three years, you were U.S. trade rep. Uh, and before that, uh, you had extensive experience in U.S. trade in the Commerce Department and the private sector with Motorola and so forth. Uh, in a few minutes, I'm going to ask you about the U.S. Trade Representative's job and world trade. But first, I'd like to step back a little bit. Um, we hear about globalization. And I've noticed when people talk about globalization, they tend to think about it as just, well, the things we buy here and the competition we face here. But in reading your remarks and other comments, um, it seems as if this is a, there's a much bigger story here. The world is getting richer, more developed, more manufacturing. Now that is globalization, but there's a larger story. Take us, just give us a sense of the, what's happening in the world in terms of economic development and manufacturing. Well, I should invite you to uh, join my, my uh, course for freshmen and sophomores in the honors program at the University of Maryland on globalization. Uh, we're going through a lot of the issues, um, whether they are trade and manufacturing and international business, the implications of technology, uh, the velocity of change, uh, implications in terms of health, in terms of national security, uh, in terms of uh, economic development, uh, a whole variety of issues that, that uh, one can associate with globalization. Uh, unfortunately, the, the term globalization has, has gotten sort of a, a bad rap uh, over the last decade or so, and I think it's unfortunate because it really uh, is, uh, encompasses a lot of things that are both good and bad, uh, many challenges, many opportunities, and, and uh, uh, trade and economic development are sort of the tip of the iceberg. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about the good for a moment. And I was struck by something I read in a recent book uh, about international trade. A and uh, this reporter had visited some, I don't know, hovel in whether it was India and I don't know what. And in this country, and, and, the, and the woman working there had you know, one of these entry level jobs in a manufacturing plant. And in this country, you know, it's all, oh, poor her, and you know, she needs a union and this. And he interviews her, and she has running water, electricity, a TV. And um, he comes away from that saying, my goodness, um, she thinks she's on the ladder to the, you know, the great new world. Tell us a little bit about that part of globalization. Well, if you think of globalization as, as a process uh, of, of interconnectedness, of openness, uh, what you discover when you start looking at the statistics is in the 1990s, countries that, that opened their markets and adopted more um, open approaches and attitudes toward trade, toward um, uh, uh, government policies, economic policies, they grew three times faster than countries that didn't. And that has manifested itself in, for example, the alleviation of 
poverty in a lot of countries. And if you, if you want to look at, discuss you know, the moral dimensions of globalization, you need to go no farther than the fact that within the last 20 years, we've probably seen 400 million Chinese and two to 300 million Indians emerge from poverty. Uh, and that in and of itself, one has to point to, and we're talking abject poverty, and there's still poverty in those countries, but it's the difference between having one meal a day and having two meals a day. It's okay. having water, uh, the water you, running water you described has implications in terms of cholera and typhoid, typhus, and a lot of diseases uh, that, that um, uh, individuals used to face, issues related to infant mortality and so on, and so the multiplier effect is truly remarkable. And that's because they're selling, making things that are sold not just in their countries, but more especially here and in Western Europe and all over the world. So it's because of the international trade. In some cases, uh, very much so. Uh, in the case of China, a lot of their growth was export-led growth. Um, now, there is a history here um, um, that makes this a little difficult. When we talk about negotiations, we should mention it. But um, I'm thinking particularly, for example, of the efforts for, to get the Indians to open their markets. Um, but as a former colonial power that saw a, a colonial um, country that saw its internal industries or clothing industries destroyed by the British in the last century or two centuries ago and in other parts of Africa. Part of this is undoing a history where the trade was an exploitation and the trade was in the other direction. Well, it, it, it is very interesting when you're, when you're studying economic development associated with globalization. Uh, what is fascinating is that what used to be this very clear distinction between rich countries and poor countries has really gotten uh, fuzzy. There's a, there's a continuum there. Uh, and, and for those of us who studied, you know, in the 1970s and 80s, well, this mumble economics, about when that mumble, was, mumble, yeah. economics of globalization, there was the first world, there was the third world, uh, and there was this pretense that somehow countries in the third world, these poor countries, could aspire to be richer countries. Well, guess what? They can, and they have. And you look at economies like the Korean economy, for example, that has made the leap. You look at, you, you look at countries, you know, look at the Asian tigers, uh, Singapore uh, developed by almost any measure um, by virtue of openness to globalization. But along this continuum, uh, what is fascinating is that the, in many cases, the attitudes of the governments in terms of their roles and responsibilities mm -hmm. uh, to the global economy have had to undergo some changes. And, and they haven't quite caught up yet with some of the benefits these advanced developing countries derive from an open trading system. Sure, but before we get too critical of the developing countries, we should remember that our country is, doesn't have a spotless record in international trade as well. Uh, the politics of this are pretty brutal. Uh, the politics of trade, unfortunately, are so often uh, characterized as a zero-sum game meaning somehow if you're winning, I must be losing in trade, when in fact uh, these international exchanges are very much win-wins. But, and, and this is an important but, and it goes to the politics, not everybody wins. And, and international trade is one of those um, phenomena where uh, the vast majority in the population wins, but there can be handfuls of individuals, communities, industries that do lose, that aren't able to compete. And so the debate becomes, do you use trade measures, border measures, that punish the vast majority or deny the benefits of trade to the vast majority to help these uh, communities that are negatively impacted? Or can you come up with approaches that just, you know, that really target help to those communities? When you were U.S. Trade Representative, how did you make the point that for the vast majority of us, trade is a benefit. What, what's the evidence? Well, you, I mean, you, there, there are a lot of different things to look at. Um, let, let's start with the most obvious, which is we're all consumers. And um, therefore, if I have access to better quality, lower cost products, it is in my interest as a consumer. And if it means that I can buy shoes for my kids and books for school rather than more expensive shoes because you know we've walled off uh, uh, our 
borders and we're making all our shoes here, uh, there is something to be said for that. Uh, so one, as consumers, 100% of us benefit uh, from more choice, better prices. Now that's particularly, I've, I've done a little reading here, and, it's, and so it's fascinating to me what some of the industries are. Um, 80, 90% of American shoes from China? Well, and this is what, uh, uh, probably by this point, yeah, China, Brazil, Spain, still sourcing a little bit, but, but very much so. Uh, China is a huge source of consumer goods. And, and one of the perception issues that we run into in terms of trade politics is this notion that somehow, well, maybe we don't make anything anymore. We must import everything manufactured from China or elsewhere. Um, and that's, it's a fallacy because the United States remains by far the largest manufacturer in the world. So, you know, $1.7 trillion in industrial output every year. And China is a distant second, you know, $1.3 trillion, a lot, but a distant second. But the difference is the kinds of things we import are consumer goods. We, you know, look at the labels on clothes or shoes or toys, toys cars, and you don't see the aircraft. You don't see the large earth-moving equipment that, that a corporation like Caterpillar makes. Uh, you don't see the turbines that GE makes and so on and so forth. But there's a huge amount of manufacturing that goes on in this country. Now, that manufacturing has, over the years, been uh, produced much more efficiently. And therefore, manufacturing employment hasn't stayed constant, hasn't kept up with manufacturing output. But every year, um, for the last 20 years, U.S. manufacturing output's gone up. So in any event, so you've got... We you should, know, let's go back for a minute on that, because I think that's a key point, and I don't think people... But I want to come back to the benefits. Sure, sure. Okay. So for a while, when GM and Chrysler were still making a lot of cars, uh, they were making all those cars with a fraction of the workforce that they had in the 1950s to make the same cars. That's right. So this is really quite striking, and, it, and it's an industry after industry. Well, and the politics, again, the, the, you know, the group that is most consistently anti-trade is organized labor. It's big labor. It's the labor unions. And the fact that up until you know, our current, obviously, the, 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 the major recession, global recession that we are in um, has skewed some of the numbers. But go back 20 years, go back 30 years, and what you discover is that the U.S. economy churns constantly, destroying jobs and creating jobs. And for the last uh, 10 years, we've created almost $2 million a year, 2 million Green jobs job. more per year than have been destroyed. But it isn't always, they aren't always created in the same fields as the ones that were lost or in the same locations. We're producing a lot of cars in this country. We don't happen to be producing them all in Detroit. You know, there are car manufacturers, including a lot of foreign car manufacturers, that are producing in the southeast, that are producing, you know, in Ohio, in, in South Carolina, um, and so on. But, but again, going back to the, to the benefits, you've got the consumer benefits. You have the fact that we are a major producer of things, um, and 95% of the consumers in the world are outside our borders. So 95% of the markets for the things that we make are outside our borders. Um, so that's another big one. Third, where is the economic growth going to come from over the next five, 10, however many years? And again, even before the recession, um, all of the prevailing statistics would tell you that that economic growth is going to come from the advanced developing countries, from the emerging markets, China, India, Brazil, uh, Indonesia, ASEAN countries. I mean, even, even as we speak, China you know, is, is boasting economic growth of 8%, uh, India 6%, Indonesia 4 to 6%, depending on how you count it. So well over half of global economic growth is going to be going on in those countries. And if you talk to any of the major manufacturers in this country, were it not for the growth in those markets, uh, we would be in far more trouble economically than we are. So, uh, you know, look at a statistic like the one that, that UPS or FedEx provides uh, for us, that for every 40 
uh, new packages moving, you know, being exported, mm -hmm. or actually exported or imported, if you think about it, uh, they hire another, another American worker. Yeah. And yet the politics of this, as you point out, so let's, let's talk about the folks who, you know, are losing. Um, the politics are pretty clear. Um, being, the politics aren't so clear, but, but... Go ahead. No, but I mean, the politics are complicated. I mean, you have, it, it used to be that trade protectionist positions were taken by individuals representing constituencies that were import sensitive, right? Uh, textile, mm -hmm. apparel, footwear. And that export-oriented constituencies, people who represented export-oriented constituencies, major manufacturers that exported, agricultural producers and so on, were pro-trade. And it, and, and it had nothing to do with party. Trade has become a much more partisan issue. Uh, and there's a split within the Democratic Party over what posture the Democratic Party ought to take over trade. And I think it's a very, it's a, I think it's dangerous in terms of US economic policy, this, this uh, split. Uh, but I think it's a, it's a real challenge for the Democratic it, Party. It goes all the way back and before, but one saw it dramatically in the Clinton administration where even when the Republicans weren't in the majority, it took Republicans to pass the president's fast track. Gosh, bipartisanship. Well, What's wrong with that? Uh, but the people left behind. Even if one just says, we have to be realistic about this. Uh, what's the best policy for them? Especially, you know, if you have someone who's a 50 year old person, it's especially if, if he's a guy, because guys are difficult to retool, right? Um, there's data about this. There's data about this. They're stubborn, you know. Uh, the women actually, do you notice that actually the average woman in this country goes through two or three different major career changes? And, and, and you know, and most of those are up. And the guys, you know, especially, anyway, enough said. So what do we do? What's the real, whether or not it's a pressing national concern, it's an important political issue. So what's the best response? We'll start with what the wrong response is. And the wrong response, as I you know, alluded to earlier, is to pretend that somehow economic isolationism is going to solve this problem or somehow correct this problem or address this problem in any positive way, and it won't. Trade protectionism, economic isolationism, economic nationalism, whatever you want to call it, in fact, exacerbates the problem. So, so let's set that one aside. Uh, I talked earlier about targeting assistance. Uh, we have a program called Trade Adjustment Assistance that was designed specifically for individuals who lose their jobs because of imports. And it does, does have a retraining component. It also has a, um, an income subsidy uh, component. If, you, if you know, the next job you take, you're going to be making somewhat less money. There's a, there is a, a differential. Uh, it has a health care uh, component. I mean, it's a very, very generous program. Now, there's some who would argue if only 2 or 3 percent of all of the unemployed in the United States can possibly point to trade as the reason for their unemployment, um, as opposed to uh, people who lose their jobs because of technology, enhanced productivity, why is it that we have such a generous program for trade related unemployment, that's a, different, that's a different issue. But one, direct targeted assistance for those individuals. And then some of the things we're arguing about, portability of health care, portability of pensions, um, retraining opportunities, those kinds of things, so that people are as mobile as they need to be. And those are obviously, every one of them is a major issue, major challenge, but each one would contribute to the ability of individuals to adjust to the rapid changes in the economy, some of which are manifested through trade, some of which aren't. I think many people feel, and I know we'll talk about the negotiations later, but I think many people feel that some countries, and I tend to think about China, aren't exactly playing by the rules, that uh, they have internally tilted, whether it's how they set the value of their currency, whether they're protectionist, at home, I think the number is 
they sell us 330 or 350 billion dollars worth of things and we sell them 50 billion or whatever. And so people feel that's really such an imbalance. Somebody must be cheating. Well, th this is sort of where a classical economist probably parts company with a, a former trade minister, okay? Um, being open, a classical economist would tell you that it is in our own national self-interest to be open regardless of what anybody does. You know, if the, if the government of China wants to subsidize my consumption and make it cheaper for me to buy whatever I buy so I can buy some other things, they're depriving their citizens of that, you know, that resource. Uh, so much the better. I mean, that, that would, you know, a classical economist would make that argument. I, I would argue, and, and, and it's clearly more politically salient, but I also think it's the right argument, uh, that you need a level playing field. And it's one of the reasons the World Trade Organization is so very important to us, and multilateral trade negotiations are so very important to us, and enforcement of existing rules is so very important. And, and uh, um, you know, during my tenure, during the Bush administration's tenure, the Clinton administration's tenure, a lot of, there was a lot of focus on enforcement of existing rules, some of which uh, come under the authority of the president, some of which, quite frankly, are on autopilot, sort of the way, uh, you know, a court system, I mean, they're, they're through the International Trade Commission and the mm -hmm. Commerce Department, and it's, it's objective rather than subjective or political criteria. You know, if a country is dumping or subsidizing product into this market, there are remedies. If a country is keeping its market closed, uh, where it has committed to open its market during trade negotiations, there are remedies. And, and in fact, uh, we filed um, the first, second, third, fifth, sixth cases against the Chinese under the WTO. Uh, and the ones that have come through the pipeline so far, we've won. The U.S. has won. In several cases, the problems have been resolved so by if, China. So if, 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 they, if they did all the things they were supposed to do, would the level of our exports to China rise and not by a dollar amount, but big time or not so big? Uh, you, you'd probably see some increase. Um, you'd probably see some increase in U.S. exports to China, although U.S. exports to China have gone up 20% a year for the last five years. On a small base. On a small base, but 20% a year is 20% a year. Uh, China is, um, you know, one of our top export markets and is one of our project, I mean, is likely to ultimately be the top export market that we have. Uh, the, the, um, uh, their exports to us, you know, if the renminbi was, was higher valued, would probably slow a little bit. Um, but my point is, I gather, it would be difficult for us to sell very much more to them. No, 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 I, 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 I disagree with that. I think, I think U.S. exports would go up and Chinese exports would go down. Um, but there are, but that's not the only important thing here. I mean, and, and I feel very strongly, and part of this uh, was one of the reasons I believe the Doha round of multilateral trade negotiations in the WTO haven't come together, is because it is important for countries like China and India and Brazil to be importing more from each other and importing more from the other, I don't know, 110, 120 developing countries in the world and not just continue with this notion that somehow the developed countries, uh, the United States, is going to be the engine of growth for development. Uh, and, so, and so it's not just U.S.-China trade that is important in terms of, of China following the rules. Uh, it is also other countries' opportunities to develop and to benefit from China's economic growth. But you make a very important point there. When I was in India, I was struck by the, I would say, fear that, that some of the Indian manufacturers I met felt about an avalanche of Chinese goods coming into India. Yeah. No, no, there, 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 are, there are real, again, this goes back to the question of when and in what ways, how fast will these emerging markets that benefit so greatly from an open world trading system, when will they step up the level of their contribution, not to the level of developed countries, 
but step up their level of, of contribution so as to continue so as to to fuel the engine of global economic growth for other developing countries and for each other. Uh, and, and in the case of India, it's interesting, India has been less reliant on foreign markets for exports. India's markets have been quite insular, and those sectors of the Indian economy that opened up in the early 1990s when the current Prime Minister, Prime Minister Singh, was the finance minister, those sectors of the Indian economy have grown the fastest and left a lot of others behind where they did not liberalize, where they did not open up. Well, this is probably a good point to close the first segment of our conversation because what you're pointing to um, is the need for change. And um, I think what you're going to say is that the negotiation of trade agreements is one channel for achieving that change. Um, so let me thank you, Susan Schwab, for being with us today. And let me thank you all in the uh, viewing audience for being with us at Policy Watch. If you want to send us a note or an email, it's policywatch at umd.edu. Susan Schwab, thank you very much for being with us, and we'll see you soon. Thank you, Doug. This program was produced by the University of Maryland, which is solely responsible for its content. The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. We are PBS.